can start. I would like just to introduce myself before giving the floor to Valerie. I'm Nazareno Pierdica from Sapienza University of NOM, and I've been recently appointed as uh, the chair of the modeling in, in a remote sensing uh, technical committee of the GRSS Society. So I will continue uh, the work that has been already done by my the previous chair. The last one uh, is Shamila from JPL. Uh, I would like to thank her for the great job that uh, she did till now. And now this is the first uh, webinar uh, that, uh, and I uh, would like to, uh, to thank very much uh, Valerie Zavrotini uh, for giving this first uh, webinar. The program, the plan, my plan is just giving some webinar on about more fundamental issues about uh, modeling remote sensing and then of course uh, we will also organize a, a webinar with more specific uh, uh, research topic i think I, I i do not have to introduce valerie because i think most of you uh, already uh, know him very well uh, it is well uh, uh, let's say famous uh, uh, guy in this field uh, so, Valerie, if you want to uh, say something more about your curricula, <laughs> but okay. uh, it's up to you. And uh, I, I want to give you the floor for this about 40 minutes presentation. And yeah. uh, probably we have another 20 minutes time for question or um, live discussion. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Valerie Zavarotti. And today I'm going to talk about modeling of electromagnetic wave scattering from rough ocean surface uh, using the small slope approximation, or for sure the SSA. To begin, I would like to appreciate a contribution from my longtime co-author and former NOAA colleague, Alex Veronovich. Here is the outline of my presentation. After a couple of introductory slides, I will proceed to a derivation of scattering amplitude expression in the SSA, and will speak about the physical meaning of various terms of the SSA expansion. After that, I will turn to a full polarization modeling of monostatic and bistatic radar scattering from a rough sea surface. It will be followed by the derivation of the second order field correlation matrix for the strong diffuse scattering regime. After that, I will present examples of computations using the SSA2 technique. Uh, the last topic of my presentation would be the non-coherent bistatic radar cross-section in the SSA1 for the weak uh, diffuse scattering regime, followed by conclusions. Classical approaches such as the small perturbation method and the Kirchhoff approximation cannot cover the entire range of practical applications. The combination of them represents the composite or two-scale model. It uses an arbitrary parameter which divides surface roughness into small and large scale components. This parameter cannot be uniquely determined and its choice affects the result of calculations. The unifying approach called a small slope approximation proposed by Alex Veronovich in 1994 is free from this drawback. It is based on transformational properties of scattering amplitudes with respect to both the horizontal and vertical shifts. The goal of classical approaches is calculation of the green function of a scattering problem. If the rough surface is plain on average, one can use a scattering amplitude instead, which describe the process of scattering of a plane wave into a plane wave. The advantage of the uh, SSA is that the slope of roughness is the only small parameter underlying the theory. Numerical calculations based on the SSA confirm this and show high efficiency of this method. 
The scattering amplitude is defined according to the following representation of the electric field in the half space above surface undulations. Equation one. Uh, notations pertaining to polarization and wave vector components are presented below. Please keep in mind that index one stands for vertical polarization and index two for horizontal polarization. The first term in one over here represents the incident field. Uh, that is a plane wave propagating in the negative directions of Z axis. Uh, the second term in one over here um, describes a scattering field formed by a superposition of outgoing waves. It should be pointed out that the expression of the electromagnetic field above the surface in terms of uh, solely outgoing wave is still valid everywhere on the surface, whereas in reality, this holds only above its maximum expression. The uh, scattering amplitude possesses two transformational properties, which are exact we have a purely geometric origin. Namely, if the boundary Z equals H is shifted as a whole in the horizontal direction, by vector V1 doesn't have to solve the scattering problem in U. It is easy to see that the uh, scattering amplitude for the horizontally shifted boundary Z equals H is a function of R minus D transform into equation two, where S is the scattering amplitude for the boundary H. Again, if the boundary Z equals H is shifted in the vertical direction by value H capital, then the scattering amplitude for the vertically shifted boundary Z equals H plus H capital will be equation three. Uh, thus, the expression for scattering amplitude is naturally perceived in the following form right here on the equation four. It is convenient to use its Fourier transform with respect to R instead of the function phi shown in equation five. Um, and to see the expression for the function of phi capital in the form of an integral power series shown in equation six, um, where H with tilde is the Fourier transform on the surface electric profile. It is possible to demonstrate uh, then, the, then the expansion proceeds with respect to derivatives of the roughness profile, that is slopes rather than with respect to the roughness heights themselves. That's why this approach is called a small slope approximation. This circumstance also allows to calculate kernel I capital sub n by comparing the expansion of six uh, with the expansion of the scattering amplitude using the small perturbation method. The small perturbation expansion of the scattering amplitude with respect to the roughness Fourier transform H tilde can be routinely produced as follows. Equation seven. Uh, by comparing seven with equation four, we obtain the scattering amplitude of the first order SSA one in the following four, equation eight. Expanding the exponential into power series with respect to H, then makes sure that the first order terms in those expansions coincide. In the next order, SSA2, there appear an additional term related to the extra integration, where M is a combination of functions B2 and B. It can be shown that function M goes to zero at psi 
equals to zero. Therefore, it serves as a high pass filter of spatial frequencies described by spectrum W capital. Functions uh, B and B2 are two by two matrices representing polarizations. They depend on the scattering geometry and the medium dielectric constant. Their explicit expressions can be found in reference form. Uh, when the second term in nine, this one, can be neglected, the SSA2 expression for the scattering amplitude in nine turns into the SSA1 expression in eight. From equation seven, we can obtain an expression for the perturbative expansion of the scattering amplitude up to the second order with respect to H tilde, equations 11. Um, uh, let us discuss the physical meaning of two terms which depend on the roughness. Uh, those terms are depicted graphically uh, below here and here. In the second order breath, the incident wave is first scattered into the intermediate virtual wave with horizontal projection of wave vector xi. And then the intermediate wave xi is scattered into the final state uh, which are uh, described by the components k and q sub k. Uh, the case when intermediate wave propagates at zero grazing angle so that the q sub uh, xi equals to zero and absolute value of xi is equals to omega divided by speed of light corresponds to the Wood's anomaly known in the theory of diffraction on gratings. It can be found here. In this situation, a sharp maximum in the dependence of the B2 on Xi takes place if the absolute value of complex value, value dielectric permittivity epsilon, absolute value, is much greater than one, as we have in the case of sea water. Fully polarimetric radars have advantages compared to more conventional single polarization radars uh, when measuring ocean wave characteristics. However, uh, the theoretical analysis of full polarization radar scattering uh, frequently presents a challenge. For example, the classical composite model fails to correctly predict the normalized radar cross section and its, its cross-polarization components. Uh, in the uh, paper six, um, a new version of the numerical implementation of the SSA2 was presented. Uh, the SSA2 correctly predicts polarization uh, also, the SSA2, as contrasted with the composite model, accounts for uh, break scattering of the second order, which is essential for modern cross polarization scattering. Uh, here, we present the results of numerical simulations of both monostatic and bistatic cross sections and scattering amplitude correlators for various ocean conditions and transmitter receiver geometries using the SSA2. We compare them with available experimental data and other modeling results. Modern polarimetric radars <clears throat> can measure not only the back scattering cross sections at given polarization, but also able to perform measurements of various mixed statistical correlators which should be treated as polarization matrices. Here we consider exactly this case. The definition of the second order field correlation matrix 
sigma in terms of scattering amplitudes is given by expression 12. I remind you that index beta corresponds to the polarization of the transmitted or incident wave and in index alpha denotes the polarization of the received or scattered wave. To arrive to a desired result, one needs to substitute the SSA2 expression 9 for the scattering amplitude from slide 6 into the definition 12 and to perform an ensemble averaging of the resulting expression under the assumption of the Gaussian distribution for the surface roughness. This would yield an expression for a dimensionless normalized field correlation matrix. matrix. Uh, the terms with average values of scattering amplitudes can be omitted for the case of a strong diffuse scattering regime, which means a large value of the Rayleigh parameter. Thus, coherent terms tends to zero. Here and here. Uh, note here that an existence of various scattering regimes, such as a coherent reflection, weak or strong diffuse, non-coherent scattering, depends on the magnitude of the Rayleigh parameter expressed by equation 16. Uh, for example, when Rayleigh parameter equals to zero, it means pure coherent reflection. When Rayleigh parameter is lex or of the order of one, we have partially coherent uh, mixed with weak diffuse scattering. And when Riley parameter is much larger than one, it means strong diffuse scattering. As a result, if we assume a strong diffuse scattering regime, we arrive to equation 14. Okay. The integration over the surface coordinates are generally speaking is in taken in infinite limits however the behavior of the exponential functions are here here and here um, under the integrals in uh, 13 is such that uh, numerical calculations uh, uh, for the numerical calcula calculations, we can limit integration over R by the effective integration area denoted here as R max, here and here. One can see that the rough surface characteristics are entering 13 through the height correlation function C and the corresponding uh, power spectral W. While the correlation function C appears in the exponential functions are under the integrals over R, the spectrum W uh, is entering a matrix factor F uh, and B, function B uh, here. Uh, which have a rather cumbersome uh, structure presented by equation 14 and 15. Now let's speak about some peculiarities of the SSA2 integrals and specifically about the resonant term M capital. Function M capital, which appears in the integrand on the previous slide, serves as a high pass filter for roughness spatial frequencies described by spectrum W capital. Function M capital at epsilon, absolute value much larger than one displays narrow sharp peak residing in circular like regions in a wave vector domain. The slide uh, pre uh, presents a 2D plot of uh, this function calculated for the backscattering uh, geometry at X band um, for incident angle of 60 degrees. These peaks uh, are associ associated with Wood's anomaly and are due to the second order backscattering process, which involves intermediate wave propagating and zero grazing angles. 
Such behavior of the integrand requires special attention uh, when a numerical algorithm is implemented for calculations of integrals in the spectral domain of function C capital N15. Uh, the contribution from these resonant terms can be overlooked if the integration grid is not fine enough. At the same time, the level of this contribution varies significantly depending on the incident angle and the wavelength. This slide presents examples of various entries of the field correlation matrix for backscattering geometry at various polarizations, calculated as a function of incident angle shown on the left panel and as a function of azimuth angle on the right panel. Uh, the curve presented at the left panel uh, were obtained for X band, wind speed of 15 meter per second. Plots A and B uh, on this panel correspond to up down wind, and plot C and D uh, corresponds to slant wind of 45 degrees direction. Uh, the legends show combinations of polarization indices involved. Two top plots illustrate behavior at the VV, HH, VH, and HV components of the normalized radar cross section. They correspond to diagonal terms of the field correlation matrix. It is seen that due to reciprocity, the cross polarized correlator with indices 1, 2, 1, 2, or VH coincides with the having indices to 1 to 1 HV. These cross polarized correlators are generally much lower than copolarized correlators, as, as we see here or here, or both on these slides. Uh, the HV and HH polarization terms become comparable only at very grazing angles. Uh, the second pair of plots, B and D, uh, demonstrates the behavior of complex entries of the polarization correlation matrix when the second pair of indices does not repeat the first one. Uh, now let's turn to the azimuthal behavior uh, of the same correlators. Here on the right panel, uh, we show various components of scattering matrix as a function of the azimuthal angle with respect to the wind direction. And next to each other, we plotted results of the SSA2 calculations, composite model calculations, and experimental results. Uh, plots uh, A and B are obtained for KU band radar signal 2.4 centimeters and the fixed angle of incident of uh, incidence of 45 degrees uh, with wind speed of 10 meters per second. The experimental curves present measurements using uh, aircraft polarimetric scatterometer um, adopted from publication seven. Plot A uh, shows comparisons of HH and VV backscattering cross sections. The best fit between two theoretical models and the experiment is observed for VV uh, polarization. For HH polarization, uh, The SSA2 and composite uh, results are clo uh, very close, but the experimental is by about 3 dB higher uh, in, a, in an upwind direction, whereas it coincides with modeled curves for the downwind directions here and here. The, uh, this discrepancy is due to the fact that real wind waves are asymmetric 
with a steeper front face, which leads to a symmetry between cross sections for these two opposite directions. Our wave model does not take into account this asymmetry of the surface waves, unfortunately. Plot B, plot B shows comparisons for VH or HV polarizations. It is seen that the SSA2 curve is much closer uh, to the experimental curve than that of the composite model. Plot C and D below, uh, show analogous comparisons for C-band radar signal of 5.3 centimeters at the fixed angle of incidence of 35 degrees and wind speed of 10 meters per second. The experimental curves um, uh, here are adopted from uh, publication eight. Uh, they are obtained uh, in the uh, radar set to experiment. The comparisons show differences similar to those from plots A and B. These differences are more likely due to differences between the actual sea surface and the modeled surface spectrum. This slide presents examples of correlation matrix sigma calculations for the bistatic geometry and L band signals. The panel on the left shows the diagonal linear polarization terms of the correlation matrix matrix or cross sections for wind speed of 10 meters per second, upwind direction and 45 degrees incident angle as a function of the zenit scattering angles for four various azimuthal scattering angles, zero, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, and 90 degrees. I remind that the zenith scattering angle is the angle with respect to the z-axis and the azimuth scattering angle is the angle with respect to x-axis, which in our case coincides with the wind direction. One can see that plot C on the left panel for the azimuth scattering angle of 60 degrees exhibits a minimum independence over the zenith scattering angle at about 45 degrees. It can be explained by the behavior of term B capital sub M with indices alpha and beta in equation 13. This term tends to zero when the equality shown below holds. Here epsilon is uh, the medium dielectric permittivity, which uh, is assumed to be real. The right panel depicts corresponding off diagonal terms. The minima are also seen in the off diagonal terms with indices 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, and 1, 1, 1, 2. On the plot C, of the right panel and with indices one, one, two, two, and two, one, two, two on the deep load of the same panel here. Um, uh, these minima are due to the same reason as uh, the minima on the left panel. It, uh, those minima uh, remotely resemble the minima of the VV polarization Fresnel reflection coefficient at the pseudo Brewster angle. But here we are dealing with incoherent rough surface scattering. 
So the physical origin of the minima in our plots is different. It should be mentioned that the similar behavior with characteristic minima of out of plane by static scattering from surfaces with Gaussian and exponential correlation functions by the surface operations was considered before in the paper by Johnson and Ouellette in transaction, Transactions on Geosense and Remote Sensing uh, 2014. As I mentioned before, regimes of ocean scattering radio waves can be quantified by the Riley roughness parameter. Previously, we considered scattering matrices for the case of strong diffuse, uh, diffuse scattering from the ocean surface, which takes place at large values of Riley parameter, which is typical for relatively high microwave frequencies from K band to C band. For L band and weak to moderate ocean winds, especially for short fetches, the Riley parameter can be rather small, uh, near one or less. These situations may occur for scattering of signals produced by the global navigation satellite system. In our 2017 paper in transactions and antennas and propagation, we obtain an expression for the bistatic radio cross section in the case of weak to moderate diffuse scattering using a formulation based on the small slope approximation of the first order. Below, we demonstrate our results for this problem. Uh, for small values of the Riley parameter, the angular distribution of the average power of the scattered signal can be expressed uh, via the generalized scattering cross section P capital, uh, which includes both coherent and non coherent or diffuse components, where V is uh, the average reflection coefficient and sigma naught is the diffuse scattering cross section per unit area. A coherent reflection is described by the average reflection coefficient V. Um, taken in the specular direction. In the geometric optics uh, approximation, it looks like this. Equation 18. Um, this result also follows from the Kirchhoff approximation which is natural because both Kirchhoff and small slope approximation methods produce the same expression for a scattered field in the specular uh, direction. The expression for the dimensionless diffuse scattering cross section in the SS1, SSA1 is shown here, this equation 19. Um, functions W and B uh, have been introduced before. Uh, w here, here, and B here. Um, the expression 19 contains the same integral as the expression for by static radar cross section obtained with the Kirchhoff approximation. Uh, the pre integral polarization. Uh, factor B is, however, different. The most important difference between the Kirchhoff approximation and the SSA1 is that the correlation function W in 19 is not generally assumed to be slowly varying on the scale of wavelength and may contain small scale components responsible for bright scattering. Let us briefly describe numerical implementation calculations of the bistatic normalized scattering cross section sigma naught for small values of the Riley parameter. The integral in 19 on the previous slide is a two dimensional Fourier transform, and it can be calculated by the fast Fourier transform procedure. However, 
a direct application of the FFT uh, will be too time consuming since one has to apply a 2D FFT and you for every incidence or scattering angle. To bypass this difficulty, we approximate the exponential in 19 by a polynomial with a finite number of terms. Let us introduce the following notation in uh, presented here in a, by equation 21. Function uh, W capital hat is a Fourier transform of the nth power uh, of the surface roughness correlation function W capital using 20 and 21 in equation 19, we obtain the bistatic radar cross-section in the form on, of 22, equation 22. Uh, to calculate this function, W capital hat, uh, one applies the FFT for each N only once. The dependence of the bistatic radar cross-section on incidence and scattering angles in 22 is now contained only in simple extraneous factors here and here. Now that uh, for calculations of W hat sub n, we use the Alpha Haley et al. spectrum. It is important to emphasize that function W hat uh, are non negative. The coefficients in front of it in 22 are positive. For this reason, the catastrophic cancellation of terms in the sum uh, in uh, 22 does not take place, uh, which ensures a high level of accuracy of this sum. In the numerical simulations performed for the case of Elven signals, results of which are shown on the next two slides, we summed up to about 150 terms. The number n of serious terms is different for each case of the incident angle and wind speed, and it is determined by the value of the Riley parameter. The larger the Riley parameter is, the, no, uh, the larger the number n that should be used. Here we see the results of calculation for by static rate cross section uh, versus wind speed and scattering angle for the weak diffuse scattering regime. Uh, the left panel demonstrates a good matchup of PRCS in the transitional zone between two regimes describing the weak and strong uh, diffuse scattering. Weak is uh, the solid curve and strong diffuse is dashed here and here. For the incident angle between 20 and 60 degrees, the merger interval of winds is between three and five meters per second. Uh, this corresponds to the Riley parameter values between 13 and 100 for the incidence angle of 20 degrees and between four and 28 for the incidence angle of 60 degrees. Uh, the position of the BRCS peaks uh, along the wind speed axis depends on the value of the incidence angle. With wind decreasing to zero here and here, the diffuse component of the reflected signal in the specular direction will also tend to zero while the 
coherent component will be sharply rising. Uh, the panel on the right demonstrates a bimodal behavior of the BRCS along the scattering angle for the case of 45 degrees of the incident angle in the range of winds between two and three meters per second. It shows that the behavior of the BRCS versus wind speed is not monotonic and it peaks at wind speed around 26, 20, uh, 2.6, 2.8 meters per second. Uh, the exact position of this peak depends on the value of the incidence and plots on the left panels support that conclusion. On this slide, we see the bistatic radar cross-section represented as a 2D map with X and Y components of the normalized scattering wave vector as axis. Uh, winds are between two and three meters per second. The incidence angle is 20 degrees and the incident plane is aligned with the wind direction. One can see that there is a depression here, here, and here uh, in these diffuse scattering diagrams in the specular direction surrounded by two distinct peaks in the plane of incidence, Ky equals to zero for two to point to 2.4 meters per second wind speeds. Uh, note that for larger right, parameter, namely for winds 2.6 and higher, the bimodality disappears. This phenomenon takes place because the C wave spectrum drops to zero at low frequencies. Indeed, for the specular directions, we have the, the component K of the vector, wave vector equals to K sub zero. And the first term in the sum of equation 22 representing first order break scattering goes to zero. With increased wind, the high order terms in series of equation 22, which are non-zero at low frequencies, start to contribute and the deep in this specular direction gradually fills in. This is illustrated in the second row of the plots on this slide. A unimodal scattering lobe emerges with a gradually decreasing peak value for moderate winds. Calculations of 2D maps of bistatic radar cross section for other incidence angles demonstrate similar behavior over the KX, KY plane with corresponding shifts of the bistatic radar cross-section maximum position. With this slide, I conclude the presentation of the main theoretical results obtained using the SSA and proceed to the conclusion. This lecture presented an overview of the small slope approximation method and results of the full polarization modeling of monostatic and bistatic radar scattering from a rough ocean surface. Examples of corresponding calculations of polarization scattering for both weak and strong diffuse scattering were discussed. They were compared with experimental data and other models. The main advantage of the small slope approximation is that it is free from the drawbacks of the composite model. In contrast to it, the SSA2 accounts for Bragg scattering of the second order, which is essential for modeling cross-polarization scattering. For example, 
the SSA2 correctly predicts the cross polarization terms of the non static normalized radio cross sections and the behavior of bi static out of plane scattering for arbitrary polarization. With the SSA1, we obtained a new result a bimodal behavior of the bi static radio cross section in forward direction for the regime of weak diffuse scattering. This result needs yet to be validated experimentally. The SSA and similar approaches were also used by other researchers. The SSA results were validated against other analytical models and numerical simulations. Conclusions were made that the SSA provides reliable predictions within the limits of its applicability. We hope this lecture was useful for those with research interests in applications of analytical scattering models for remote sensing of ocean and other earth surfaces. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Barry. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for having me. And uh, yes, it was a very comprehensive view of the SSA model and uh, its application. For uh, any young researcher that is uh, attending this uh, uh, webinar, uh, I have to say that in order to uh, really understand everything. We have to work uh, quite a bit, <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, the presentation was very comprehensive, uh, very useful. Uh, and now we have some time to for discussion or questions. Uh, I have seen a question in the chat uh, from Mao Ta. Uh, which ask uh, what does uh, uh, sinus at minus two uh, mean or slide 12 at the bottom? Uh, does it mean uh, one over uh, square sin? So, uh, uh, this one? Uh, can, can you see the slide 12? Uh, I, I think that is just the, the last line. Sinus, uh, okay, in, ye uh, in yellow, sinus minus two, just uh, the, in the last uh, line, I like it yeah. in uh, light yellow. It, it means that one over si uh, uh, sine square. Okay, okay. So it's uh, just, you know, to make it in one line to save uh. some. Uh, uh, yes, sorry. yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry for that. Uh... And there is another question uh, uh, about how the smooth loop approximation compare with the integral equation uh, method, the, the so-called IEM, uh, which is also quite popular in the remote sensing community. Do you have any um, any? Uh, say yeah. something to say about this uh, comparison with IEM. Uh, we did uh, we did uh, the comparisons, uh, but uh, those results are not published. I would say that um, it's very difficult to make like one to one comparisons of these two methods. Basically, they pursue the same goal. Uh, EIM also um, kind of. Uh, you know, target the same, uh, uh, you know, outcome to have uh, one solution for both, uh, for any angle. So from the specular, quasi-specular quasi reflections toward the break scattering and so on. But uh, it, uh, it it is obtained by somewhat different set of um, uh, assumptions. Um, so, I, I think they, they might uh, be pretty close, but uh, I, I'm not sure about some kind of uh, peculiar results about the like out of plane. We didn't check that if we have uh, similar results, but 
on the level of uh, diagonal terms of the matrix, uh, scattering matrix like HHVV, uh, those terms look uh, similar or the same kind of level. So yeah, I, uh, th that method is uh, also very popular and used in many uh, papers. Valery, it seems to me that uh, uh, probably the small group approximation is more popular among uh, uh, research involved in uh, remote sensing of the ocean. And instead, the uh, IEM uh, is uh, more popular uh, about people involved in modeling the scattering from land. I don't know why, but I have this impression. And then I'm wondering if this is related in some way to any a specific uh, assumption of the two approaches. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you. Maybe it's mm. just a historical kind of. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is no uh, kind of some serious considerations behind that. Yeah, it would be interesting if someone maybe from uh, young researchers will uh, go to that, um, you know, field and uh, do the, uh, you know, comparisons between these two methods. I remember that in in uh, the review by uh, Elfa Haley in Buran, there were some critical uh, statements made uh, with respect to uh, uh, this uh, IEM I, I method. And there were some publications, I forgot the last name of the author who argued about the validity of IEM and actually it provoked some additional improvements uh, because there was an original IEM and then it was like a improved or you know kind of corrected IEM publications by uh, the uh, you know authors of this uh, the uh, you know the Funk uh, Adrian Funk and his uh, colleagues so yeah if if people find uh, some um, uh, you know some advantages in using IM, uh, it would be nice also to prove that uh, there is no discrepancies between uh, the results obtained with IM and other methods. Otherwise, you know, they might be uh, simply analogous. Different formulations might lead to basically the same outcome, the same result. Okay, just uh, to let to, to, you know, uh, we are planning also to organize another webinar uh, with this uh, uh, sort of, uh, let's say, foundations, and uh, one of these will be about IEM, uh, but I will uh, uh, advertise on this, uh, of course, uh, uh, through the, the standard uh, IGRSS uh, uh, social media, as uh, you know. And then there is another question by Jack uh, Sillier. Uh, are these results uh, calculated for a non-minidirectional wave spectrum, or do you take the directional spectrum into account as well? Oh, uh, we use that uh, alpha hill. You, do you mean the uh, spectrum of sea surface? Yes, I think so. But in case you can unmute uh, from the audience if you want to uh, make question uh, uh, yourself. Yes, yes. Uh, the, he was referring to uh, the sea surface. Yeah, yeah. So we used uh, this uh, also widely popular spectrum by Alpha Haley, which is directional spectrum. It has a, a, as a parameter the, the wind direction, so we can uh, see that, but it's only, you know, it's uh, kind of symmetrical. We cannot see the up uh, difference between up and down, but we see the difference between up, down and the crosswind. That's uh, which it is possesses that uh, property. So it's kind of a butterfly a shaped, um, you know, diagram for the directional part of the spectrum. It is represented as a product of uh, omnidirectional part, which doesn't depend on directions, times some function, which uh, describes the directivity of the waves. And uh, the main property is that the 
uh, axis of uh, symmetry coincides with the wind direction. Of course, it's a kind of um, idealization because in different specific conditions, you might have uh, different types of complications. For example, we never um, mentioned here the swell contribution. So in reality, swell is omnipresent and you kind of need to uh, insert that contribution separately as an additional spectral component. And it might have uh, not uh, related to the local wind direction uh, directivity. So yeah, so directivity, but generally for that uh, sim simple case of uh, just wind generated waves without swell, we use the alpha Halley spectrum, which uh, has the directivity. Okay, there is another question from Ed, Ed Westwater. I would like to say again uh, hello to Ed. Uh, the question is about, uh, okay, uh, is there any work using the bistatic scattering from uh, small drop approximation to simulate uh, the emissivity, that is the emission, especially uh, emission measured by a polarimetric radiometer. Do you know any work using SSA for yeah. passive? Yeah, by the way, um, the uh, thermal emission actually kind of sensitive to that, um, uh, you know, effect which was demonstrated with those uh, uh, wood anomaly kind of terms when you have intermediate um, uh, a kind of re-scattering along the surface. And there were papers by um, uh, Vladimir Irisov on that. And initially they call it a critical phenomena. And uh, there were some um, uh, publications in 90s uh, on, on that. And uh, uh, Vladimir Irisov was using the small slope approximation for uh, the thermal, for for the you know calculation of the emissivity, um, and also I think Joel Johnson uh, also did it with uh, Tony Alfahaley. They had a publication on thermal radiation uh, modeling using the small slope approximation, and not only small slope, but also uh, Tony suggested his own um, approaches uh, to to this uh, problem. Uh, similar kind of to small slope, but uh, slightly different. So there were also publications and uh, I can send, uh, uh, it's uh, Ed, right? Ed, it was yes, your yes. question, Ed Westwater. I can send those uh, references to you if you wish. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I don't know if you have time, but there are another couple of questions. One is from Morgan Liu. Uh, okay, uh, is the interest in modeling uh, the scattering from uh, uh, surface like a lunar surface uh, with some uh, regolith uh, layer? And he's asking uh, if there is uh, any connection between the scattering of particulate surface and the small slope approximation. I guess that probably uh, regolith scattering has to do also with the volume scattering, not only uh, rough uh, surface scattering, but uh, okay, Valerie, I don't know right. if you... Uh... Okay, yeah, that, that, that's a very uh, interesting question because at some point in the past, we also were interested in, you know, scattering from more complex uh, surfaces uh, than, you know, can be captured by this model. Unfortunately, I would say that the title itself says that uh, it's limited by the small slopes. So if you have a surface and uh, you look at the, you know, the slopes of it, and if they are steep, then this wouldn't work because uh, as you remember, uh, all this method is based on the O'Reilly hypothesis. And Riley hypothesis assumes that uh, uh, the fields above the surface can be represented by only outgoing waves, only waves which propagates up, not down. But if you have a very rough, you know, like steep, like rocks, for example, uh, surface, you would see that if you're going below the 
the crests, the, the top points of the surface into the, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, cavities kind of, you will have their field uh, um, composed of the waves or uh, uh, generated by uh, scattered waves propagating down from say one slope down to uh, bottom and then goes up and it could be many uh, many uh, orders of reflections. If the uh, scattering process is dominated by this type of scattering called multiple scattering or like in volumetric uh, vo uh, medium, you also have this, uh, then it wouldn't work. So uh, at this point, I uh, my answer is negative. Uh, the SSA cannot be um, described by that. Uh, by, uh, small slope approximations cannot be applied for the case of like uh, lunar regolith or uh, any kind of like uh, even on Earth. Uh, if you will uh, look at the you know very rugged terrain, say rocks and uh, cliffs and so on, in in this uh, case it wouldn't work. Uh, and I know that uh, most of what people are using some kind of uh, empirical or semi-empirical models, or you go to very complex uh, direct numerical numerical simulations. Maybe tomorrow there will be a presentation by Leon Tsang, who is pursuing that direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe right. in the future, yeah. You yes. may ask him to do that. Uh, that type of uh, calculations, when you just take the Maxwell equations and directly uh, do the calculations uh, on the grid, you know, and but they, they of course, very, uh, they cannot be shown in, a, uh, you know, in the form of some analytical, simple analytical expressions as it was shown here. It would be just, you know, the numerical code, uh, uh, and it will take a long, uh, you know, very powerful computers and um, a lot of time. Okay, I see also uh, a question from Clifford Mertz. Yes, yes. Have you worked on data comparisons with oceanographic HF radars? Yeah, uh, at, at some point we um, uh, collaborated with uh, Donald Barrick, you know, that uh, coders. Uh, uh, Ocean Coders Company. Uh, it didn't result in any publications, but in principle, uh, SSA uh, is, uh, you know, can be used because uh, in this case, you know, HF radars, it's very long, uh, rather long waves. And the, uh, you know, on, the sc on these scales, uh, sea surface looks rather smooth, uh, even if it has breakers, but because they are very, uh, small scale features and uh, small slope approximation should work nicely. By the way, uh, this um, uh, by modal behavior of the weak um, uh, scattering, which I've shown in the last slides, actually it resembles uh, the type of scattering which you have in the like uh, coastal HF uh, radars when they uh, have uh, like a first order brag and they have two peaks um, uh, and when the you know a wind picks up and you have a contribution of the second order brag then that uh, you know depression between two peaks fills in by uh, the high order term so that there is some similarity in that and then uh, Valerie Manuela, Manuela oh, okay, Chinella yeah. from Isa. Uh, yeah, hi, Manuel. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, I see your question. Uh, so uh, down to which elevation angle does the SSA theory goes uh, and when it uh, can be uh, applied? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, of course, um, there is a limitation on the elevation angle. Uh, so when you... Uh, uh, if your elevation angles of, is of the order of the variance of uh, sea surface slopes, then it breaks. It, it, it would produce incorrect result. And again, you, you might, may um, understand why it happens. When you have this kind of uh, close to grazing uh, propagation with respect to the surface, you might have multiple reflections or shadowing by the uh, you know, the excursions of the surface. 
and that's the case which is not described by this model. It uh, assumes that you don't have, um, you know, any kind of multiple or uh, scattering or uh, shadowing because that would uh, contradict the uh, initial assumptions of Riley hypothesis that all the uh, all solutions uh, scattering of scattering problem can be represented as uh, by only outgoing waves because in this case it will be uh, wa waves which propagates toward reflected waves I mean uh, which propagates to the surface and then reflects back or uh, from other uh, you know uh, patches of the surface and so on and so on so um, if your surface uh, is gentle, the more gentle is your surface, the, the more uh, grazing angles can be uh, used for the simulations. But it, it's, they are going in sync. The, the more steeper your surface, the, uh, you have more increased area of grazing angles when this method wouldn't work. Uh, okay, sorry, Valerie, but there is another question. <laughs> uh, this is from uh, um, Ahmed. Yeah, Malakdev. I see that. Uh, ah, I, I see from Yakov, from Yakov Toporkov. Um, yes, but there is one, uh, two more questions before. Oh, okay, let me uh, go back from Ahmed. Ahmed. Bala, yes, Bala. yes, Ahmed, yes. Uh, uh, what is the limitation of SSA to hold for fine range resolution or small patch of the surface? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a tough question because, <laughs> you know, if you look at this simulation, the surface is unlimited. So it's kind of like a infinite plane wave, a plane wave hitting infinite uh, uh, plane on the average rough surface and you are receiving somewhere far away a uh, plane wave solution. So um, I, I don't have a, uh, you know, I would say like it should be um, uh, many times like, you know, 10 times larger than the largest scale which you uh, have in your surface. Like if you, take the spectrum and uh, calculate and look at the low frequency end of the spectrum, calculate the longest waves. Uh, you should say, take that uh, scale, multiply say by 10, you know, just uh, roughly. And that would be the, um, the smallest patch you can uh, model. You can trust to that, that would be my, uh, answer, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe someone will correct. Uh, you know, Yakov is asking, doesn't SSA include multiple interactions? You know, uh, in a sense, like if you look at the, say, uh, um, small perturbation uh, expansion, it, it, it has, you know, you may treat those terms as, uh, you know, like acts of multiple scattering. But um, on the other hand, as I said, this uh, um, Riley uh, hypothesis assumes that you don't have, uh, you know, waves which propagates in the opposite directions to, uh, 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 that is to, toward the surface. So with this, you know, the, the term multiple interactions uh, sounds a little bit, um, um, you know, not not very well defined. What do you mean by interactions like multiple scattering? You know, uh, th there is a, a situation when the wave may propagate along the surface, like when the raising angle is equal zero. That's probably the only multiple interactions <laughs> which are captured by these approximations. But if you would have say a negative component of this psi that probably wouldn't be captured by this uh, surface. Do you agree with me, Jakob? Uh, yes, I, I made comment that uh, this like interaction when K naught goes into zeta and then into K 
maybe that what I meant by the inter multiple interaction one. Oh, kind okay, of. okay. Okay, yes, so what the, we have sorry. more uh, questions. How do breaking waves affect the uh, accuracy of your results? Uh, we published a paper, uh, by the way, uh, I, uh, we re refer to it somewhere. Uh, let me see. Yeah, this one, uh, reference four, uh, you see, it has uh, this kind of uh, addition uh, modeling with uh, breaking waves. Uh, that paper was uh, based on the kind of first version of the small slope approximation, which slightly different from what we used uh, later. Uh, we made some modifications to it and uh, it's kind of improved the accuracy. But uh, uh, in general, uh, we wanted also to check the results of um, small slope approximations with some experimental uh, results, which includes the situations when you have breaking waves. And we found that actually, uh, like if for VV polarization, we have uh, more or less good, uh, you know, match up with our mode between our model and experiment. For HH, uh, we didn't have, and we attributed that discrepancy to the contribution of breaking waves, and we fixed it with some kind of uh, uh, quick and dirty, <laughs> so to speak, approach. Uh, we added some term from uh, breaking waves, describing in by the probability of slopes like Cox and Monk probability, we added that uh, like specular, specular reflections. If you have a, say, a facet, which looks, uh, you know, when the incident wave hits it perpendicularly, you will have a specular reflections in back uh, direction, backward direction. So, uh, and we found that actually it improves the result. We didn't go too far with that. That was the only our publications, but publication which um, were uh, addressing that problem of breaking waves. But indeed, uh, breaking waves, um, again, uh, breaking waves, if you look at the geometry of breaking waves, they have very steep slopes. And if they are very steep, again, this is not uh, going to, uh, uh, be, uh, you know, good to, to, to use the small slope approximation in this case, but it can be kind of, um, you know, augmented by some additional term uh, in the kind of spirit of what we did in that uh, paper from 2001. Okay, uh, uh, Yakov is asking, uh, can, can, you, can you elaborate on that? Uh, oh no! Uh, it, it was just my comment that uh, what is meant, what I meant by oh, multiple yeah, interactions, right. that your slide where you kind of uh, right, right, in, in conversion that's... of the wave numbers. So that, that, that yeah, just... yeah. that's correct. That that's basically uh, if you mean by multiple interactions, yes, it it, it includes that type of multiple interactions when you have uh, uh, some intermediate waves, uh, but they probably should be, uh, uh, you know, propagating only along the surface. Otherwise they would, well, if they will have some negative component, uh, if the zeta or psi rather uh, would have the negative component uh, that probably would violate the Riley uh, hypothesis. Uh, okay, do we have more? Uh, I think that the not any more questions, uh, uh, but uh, in any case, uh, we had a lot of uh, a lot of questions. So this demonstrated the interest uh, and uh, the effectiveness of your uh, presentation, Barry. Uh, if not, uh, okay, uh, probably uh, we can stop here, and uh, I would of course uh, ask like to uh, thank Valerie Zavarotti a lot for uh, his time, uh, both during this uh, webinar and also, I, I guess, for preparing uh, his nice presentation. And of course, also, I would like to thank everyone for attending uh, this uh, 
uh, webinar uh, promoted by the new technical committee. Uh, so uh, thank you again, Valerie, and uh, thank you everyone. Thank uh, have a good time. Thank you very and, much for uh, having me. <laughs> see you next time. Uh, and, bye. Yeah, Please, uh, if you want to add you. something, bye. Thank you, every everyone, for coming and listening to me. Thank you very much.